Can we give can we give our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ a praise in this room? Can we do that? That is so incredibly weak. Can we give our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ a praise in this room? Hallelujah. Lord, we worship you and we give your name glory. There is none like you in all the earth, O oh God. King of kings and Lord of lords, supreme. We come before you tonight, Lord Jesus, thanking you that you have given us your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. We hide it in our hearts, and it keeps us from sinning against you. We thank you that your word does not return unto you void or empty, but it accomplishes what you purpose and please. So we don't have to wait to the end of messages to give you praise. But faith calleth those things that be not as though they already were. So we thank you in advance for what you will sovereignly speak to us. And we thank you that our lives and our cities and our youth ministries will be forever changed because of your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we praise and we pray. Amen and amen. Give him another praise as you take your seats. Hallelujah. What a joy it is to be here and uh, what an honor uh, to share on this um, incredible um, stage with what I believe is one of the best conferences in the nation. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, I mean, yeah, we can really, that, that, that merits. Um, I'm going to just be candid because that's, that's kind of how I roll and kind of how I am. And uh, what ends up happening, you all, is that as an, uh, by the way, I'm African American. And uh, I've been that way, you know, a long time. And um, what happens is, is that as you become a uh, person who's done ministry and done it with some measure of success, um, and then you become articulate, uh, you become often sought after by many um, conferences and denominational meetings to be the speaker for their various events. And when I go to these different places, it's amazing sometimes um, the, the second or third agendas that drive sometimes these uh, type of gatherings. But what blesses me about this conference, you all, is that this is a conference, I believe, that is designed for the regular, I mean, heart, loving young people, grassroots, uh, in-your-face type youth worker who is not into all the fluff but wants to really see things change. And so I honor the Lord for this conference, and I pray that you would get the best out of this because I believe the best is in it for you. Um, if you have your Bibles uh, tonight, we're going to be coming from Isaiah chapter 61, Old Testament passage, Isaiah chapter 61. <coughs> and... Um, I just feel like preaching tonight. Now, you know, for those of you who don't know, um, there is a difference. Okay? All good preaching needs to have some teaching uh, because you need to be able to understand something that you've not understood before. Uh, but not all teaching is preaching. Uh, preaching is when you really proclaim and reaffirm what you already know. In other words, sometimes the enemy will come in and make you forget what God already told you. And sometimes you just have to be reminded of what you already know. You have to ha kind of be proclaimed to. And so in addition to doing some teaching tonight, I do come to proclaim some things that I feel you already know, but the journey and the weariness of youth ministry can make you sometimes have um, selective amnesia and forget. Isaiah 61, and I'm reading from uh, the New International Version. Well, I don't know which version this is. I'm reading from the Bible. Um, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called mighty oaks, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord, and you will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of the nations, and of their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, 
you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. I want you to turn to the person sitting next to you, if you don't mind, and help me announce this topic. Just kind of look at somebody on either side, find them, and just say to them, neighbor. Some of y'all did not do it. You actually have to turn and, and do what I'm saying. You have to turn to somebody and, and just look at them. It may be difficult, but the lights are kind of low. Look at them and say to them, neighbor, are you ready to raise a new city? I need you to turn to the other person, look at them and say to them, hey, you, are you ready to raise a new city? Then I need you to shout out loud, hey, I'm ready to raise a new city. Hallelujah. Give God praise in advance. Hallelujah. Listen, you all, uh, uh, I'm convinced that the church of Jesus Christ across the world has lost its relevance. I'm convinced, unfortunately, that the church of Jesus Christ, not only across the world, but particularly in America, which now we find many missionaries from other countries are coming over to the United States to share with us the gospel because they see that we have become confused with uh, what we deem as one nation under God, but yet we don't live what we say. And so it, it appears to me, you all, that for the amount of churches that there are in the world, there should definitely have been a change in the world climate. For the amount of churches that there are, skip the world, for the amount of churches that there are in your city, there should be a change in the way things are going in your town. All right, skip that. For the amount of churches that are on your block or, or you know, come on now. In Chicago, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, 79th Street. There, there, there's enough churches on 79th Street to save the world 15 times over. In Detroit, there's a, school, there's, a, there's, a, there's a street called Puritan, and there's 15 million and 500,000 churches on Puritan alone. That street alone should cause the whole world to be saved. If the church is the light of the world, then why is the world still dark? Could y'all do me a favor, uh, lighting people? I didn't give y'all a cue on this. Could y'all just turn the lights down real quick? I didn't give you any cue, so I don't know. Yeah, oh, that's good. Just kind of, yeah, lower them a little bit more. All right, now, 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 I'm going to just say something, and I need you to see whether or not I'm really telling the truth. The lights are on full strength. Well, it has to be because I'm saying it loud. Mm, the lights are on <laughs> full strength. <laughs> Ooh, the lights are on. Are they on? How about a community choir? The light is on. The light is on. I mean, can, I mean, the lights have got to be on because we're singing, right? And we're, we're preaching and we're talking about light being on. But if darkness exists, then it means that light is not shining, period. Which means if there's drug houses and crack addicts and kids who can't read and people who are in bondage, it means that the church who claims that light is on is lying because when light is on, darkness leaves. Period. Thank you. So it amazes me how all of us who claim to carry this gospel seem to see very little change. Most of us are involved in student ministries that in all honesty, and I'll just be honest with you, are pretty sad. They're pretty empty and pretty devoid of power. But today, in the name of Jesus, I'm coming here on assignment to help you understand your mission to raise a city. Because it's not going to come from government. It's not going to come from uh, people with money in corporate America necessarily. But it will come from those who understand the kingdom principles of God and begin to use them and utilize them, all right? So the Old Testament here is a very familiar passage. And I want to just kind of walk through this verse by verse and then we'll just be gone. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now you are, I believe, we believe the spirit comes on us just to be on us. I grew up in the church, you all, and, and it's kind of funny because I used to see people catch the Holy Ghost like he was a baseball. And the implication is once I catch him, I must throw him back. And so I would see people when they would catch the Holy Ghost and they would instantly start dancing and tearing up stuff and, uh, and seldom, uh, sometimes they would even hit me. And I would, I would tell my mother, Mom, is this what the Holy Ghost does for Sister Jones to just hit me in the eye like that? I didn't understand what the Holy Ghost meant, but in most churches, when the people say that they had the Spirit of God, it usually meant that they were getting ready to shout. And other people, there's sometimes a manifestation is that they begin to do something. They begin to, to maybe have some spiritual manifestation of that, and they might speak in tongues, although sometimes they may not speak to me. They would definitely sometimes speak in tongues. And I'm not against speaking in tongues because I have that gift, so don't start hating on me. I have it. 
The issue is this, though. What is the purpose of the Spirit of God inside of a person? What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit of God inside of his church and inside of your ministry? Is it for you to be gathered around pizza and gathered around meaningless Friday night discussions? Or is it for you to build a group of young people who are fiercely and unashamedly committed to Jesus Christ, that are filled with the knowledge of his word, who are changed by it, and thus will change the world? And y'all, if you're building your ministry on hot dogs and pizza, then you always have to have it. You better, you better show up one day and not have no pizza and see what happens. Show up one day and not have no pop and see what happens if you're building your ministry around that. But when you build it around the word of God and around an understanding of the spirit of God and what that means, then you can begin to see transformational youth ministry and then thusly find transformational cities. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. <clears throat> proclaim freedom for the captives and release of darkness from prisoners. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. The spirit of God is on us for a purpose. The anointing is on us for a reason. Here's the question. What has your youth ministry done this year to change the world? Or have we reduced it to just some curriculum that you bought to sustain somebody else's vision that's really not why you got in youth ministry in the first place? Why did you, why did you accept youth ministry? Can I tell you what happened to some of y'all? Some of y'all were asked, remember that? And you said, no, I can't do this, Pastor. He said, yes, you can. I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. Remember that conversation? Come on now, I'm speaking. I'm, I'm, the Lord is speaking through me. Uh, um, I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. Now, whether or not he did or just wanted to, you know, get you in it, I don't know. But bottom line is that you were now the head of the youth ministry. You had no idea what to do. Remember that? You went back and said, surely this person has not heard from God. And you started going and finding every resource you could find. Remember that? I'm going to go to the bookstore. And I'm going to get a book on youth ministry. Remember that? And so you start getting books. And what's so sad is that for some of y'all that are in urban context, all the books were written by people in the suburbs. And so everything, everything that they had as a social example was stuff that your kids would be like, I know you got to be crazy, right? I never forget, I went to one ministry and they told me, well, we're going to go out in the mud. And we're going to have a mud fight. I'm like, yeah, right. That's going to work. I wish I would. I wish I would bring Junebug out in the mud after he didn't get his new, you know, yeah, right. That ain't gonna, so bottom line is that you have to get all these books and decide how to develop ministry in a context that didn't fit you. But in the midst of it, you begin to do the best that you could. But somewhere along the line, what you felt in your heart was what God's call to change young people and thus change the neighborhood got blended into some other meaningless dribble called youth group. Where you don't see life change. Where you don't see young people on fire for God or wanting to change anything because you've compromised what you heard from God. So I came today to help you re-remember what it is that God called you to do. The Spirit of the Lord is on you so that you can be one who changes the world. Preach the good news to the poor. Find those whose hearts are broken and begin to mend them. Find those who are in bondage or in prison and set the captives free. That is what the Spirit of God is on you to do. Over now, about 20 years ago or so, I was a youth pastor in Chicago. And I did not know anything about youth ministry other than the fact that I believe youth ministry should change the world. And so our whole youth ministry was built around changing the world. I never forget our permission slips. Uh, they, were, they read, in case of death that is not associated to negligence on the part of the ministry, we will not be liable for the death of your son or daughter. And that is what our parents signed because all of our events were literally risk-taking events that the kids could lose their lives. We came to L.A. in the middle of, back in those days, it used to be a big thing to ride down uh, Crenshaw with the cars. It may still be, I don't know. But that's what it was back then. And so we set up a soundstage that we paid for in the middle of the night and did a truce between the Crips and the Bloods. In the middle of the night, we had over 1,000 people gather around, give their life to Christ, and a truce was called because our youth ministry decided to just be radical and change a neighborhood. 
We went into the middle of Little Rock. They did an episode on HBO called Banging in Little Rock. And we, we would look at what is the dangerous place in America. That's where we're going to spend our summer. And the kids would pay money to go, and they would literally go and step and rap and sing and do whatever. But in the middle of that, people's lives were changed because we understood the Spirit of God is on us not to sit in a circle or a group, but to change the community that we're in. Are y'all hearing this? Now I'm a senior pastor, and I'm in Detroit, Michigan. And in the middle of this city, it's amazing what God has been able to do. Because to me, youth ministry is not what we do to minister to youth, but youth who minister. It's called a paradigm shift. Listen, youth ministry is not you sitting up trying to figure out what more you have to do to appease some ruined, self-centered, lecherous youth and their disinterested parents. It is you developing youth who do ministry. That is youth ministry. Singles ministry is singles ministering. Are y'all hearing this? So, so my church in, in Detroit said, what are we going to do for men's ministry? I said, we're going to get the men and go minister. So we set up tents in front of the crack houses. I'm talking about like, you know, tent, like camping. We call it urban camping. With campfire and marshmallows and s'mores in the hood, right in front of the crack house. Who going to buy some rocks with a bunch of white, black, and Hispanic people, 50 of them sitting in the campfire singing Jesus reigns kumbaya? Ain't nobody buying no crack on the block. That's how you change a city. It ain't in no little circle and a meeting inside the church. It is time that you as a youth worker understand youth want radical change. Are y'all hearing this? So I, all right, I got to watch my clock. All right, here we go. So it says that the Spirit of God is on us to do something. All this Holy Ghost and ain't nothing changing. Here we are in Azusa. This is where the Holy Ghost lives. Man, I mean, this is, this, this, this is headquarters right here. We, we are in Holy Ghost headquarters in Azusa. I ain't never been to Azusa, but when I crossed the little sign, come on now, I just say, I feel a little something in my chandelo. What is the purpose of a gas station when cars get filled with gas and don't leave the gas station? What is the purpose of your continued conference going when you get revelation and do nothing with the revelation that you receive? It's called tapping or capping it off. It's when your tank is full and you put more gas in it and the new gas spills on the ground. That is why some of us have no fresh revelation because we haven't done anything with the previous revelation that God gave us a year ago. God told you what to do with your youth ministry in the last conference. But you needed another word. You needed another confirmation. You needed another meeting. I could just throw up and not wipe it off at meetings. I'm so tired of meetings. I'm so tired of talk. I'm so tired of people saying what they're going to do. Where are the people who are ready to be the remnant that God has called for this hour? Where are you? I'm saying you are here by appointment. All of y'all in here, you never fit in. You didn't belong nowhere. You couldn't get in if you paid somebody. You felt like you were adopted because you weren't even like your family. You never understood why you saw things differently. You never understood why you always were alone, even in a crowd. Well, because turkeys, they flock together, but eagles fly alone. And God has sent you here to remind you why his spirit is in you so that you would begin to do what others have not done. He said, I'm going to exchange your mourning for praise and joy and give you a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. 
Then he says in verse 4 what I want to spend the rest of our talk on. This is what they will do. Who? Us. This is, this is what those who are filled with the Spirit of God will do. It says here that they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. God says, here's the promise, that you as a youth worker can be used by God to change a city. Here's the question, do you even have faith to believe that? Do you really believe that God is able to change stuff for real? Y'all, yeah, I'm going to tell you something. I'm crazy as far as my faith. I, it's nothing that I don't believe God can, can, can like not do. I mean, I believe God can do anything. And some of y'all in this room have been so contaminated by organized Christianity that you've lost unbridled belief and faith that you can do anything. In our church, you all in Chicago, the youth ministry was so strong that the deacons who went through deacons training in our church became deacons in the church. That means they were a part of the deacon board of the adult congregation. And they began to call shots and help be able to make executive decisions for the furtherance of the church because our program for discipleship was so tight that those young people who had gone through three years of Christian discipleship were just as much understanding the scriptures and the word of God as those older people chronologically who had been maybe saved a day and gone through a couple of years. What kind of program are you developing to have young people that can change the world and that can help cities be reborn? Here's the question. What is your summer schedule for your youth ministry? Think about it. Okay, you're going to an amusement park. Whoa. That's definitely going to change a whole lot. There'll be an increased pregnancy. There'll be some new weed on the back of the bus. What's that smell? I told y'all don't be bringing weed on the bus. What's that? There'll be some... Uh, some drama and some unnecessary conflict that will have to be resolved on the bus. There will be drama of parents who don't have money, and when you come back to the trip, you got to wait for 15 years for them to pick up their kids. Come on, don't look at me in that tone of voice. You know I'm telling the truth. What else do you have planned? Camp. Oh, yeah, camp is always good. Yep, 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 go to camp. We're going to get born again again. <laughs> Sling snot cry. Yes, I hear the Lord's call. Yes, all that. Yep, yep, sure will. Okay. All right, what else? Just, yeah, throw out some ideas. What else are you going to do this summer? Missions trip. Missions trips are great where you can go somewhere else and see how much better you are than others and say, oh, you know, brother, I'm so glad we can help build this hut for you. Oh, God loves you. Let me get back to my crew. Where's my iPod? Okay. Now, I'm not saying that's the, but okay, wait, wait, wait. and listen, y'all, listen, we believe in missions trips. We give more money to missions than anything in our church. I believe in it, but let me just hear some more stuff. What else? Car wash, car wash, working at the car wash. Yeah, car wash, car wash is always a fundraiser. People come and, you know, the kids out there, we're going to wash y'all cars. We can help the youth ministry because we broke. You know, we don't get no budget money sent to us at all. And uh, we need to wash some cars and sell some M&Ms or some Skittles. We can definitely build the ministry that way, uh, not tithes and offerings from kids who have more money than their parents often. But, but instead, we're going to sell some Tootsie Rolls and some Skittles. And car wash. Okay, yes, what else? All right, she just put me to shame and shut me up. You, you messed up my illustration. Go back to the back of the room. You're not supposed to do that. She said, we're taking a group to all of the original 13 colonies. And you're distributing backpacks to those who are in need in those communities and being... Then you become pen pals and fly them into the city and help them. You go, girl. Well, all right now. All right now. That's all right with me. Now, listen. One out of 500 of y'all. And listen, y'all, I'm not here to be, how can I say this, to make you feel like, man, I'm not doing anything. I'm really here to help us see how far we've gotten away from changing the city. I'm so tired of hearing. Have y'all been to conferences where these 
these big old banners say stuff that we never do? Changing the world. Changing the generation conference. Raising all that kind of stuff. And nobody does it. Come on now. It's another binder, isn't it? It's another binder you put on the shelf until the next conference that you're going to change the world, change the generation. Can't tell you what we're going to do today. We're going to accept our calling. And you're going to stop being a, 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 a afraid, fearful, uh, lied to person who doesn't feel that you're able to do what God has positioned you to do. Youth ministry is not a stepping stone to greater ministry. Youth ministry is not a place that you go till you get a real ministry position. It is not a place where you use young people as some kind of resume filler till you get where you want to go. This is the generation that God has sovereignly called you to. And it is with honor and with respect that you will do with diligence what you've been called to do. And if you're in it for the wrong reason, may the sovereign Lord himself put you out before you get back home. I'm a prophet, too. It'll happen. So you better, like, change up your emotions now. I really love it. I really love it. I really love it. I love these kids. <laughs> change it up. And some of y'all that ain't laughing, that's your problem right there. You ain't laughed the whole session. And I'm a, I'm a funny person. That's why you're no good in youth ministry, because you're boring. Nobody likes you. You're, listen, you don't like you. Your own kids don't like you. None of the people that came with you like you. That's why they went to lunch and you were left alone, because nobody likes you. Get a life. I'm saying funny stuff. What's wrong with you? Come on, y'all. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Have you ever met a youth worker that is, like, obviously in the wrong position? I'm going to tell you something. I'm, I'm almost finished. I'm, I'm into the power of God for real. And I'm into people dropping dead who dishonor the Holy Ghost. See, y'all think I'm kidding. I'm, I'm serious. I'm, people that start lying on the Holy Ghost, I'm into them dropping dead like Ananias and Sapphira. Talking about, yep, I so did give. I get bam, dead. Yep, I'm a youth worker. I love young people. Boom, before you get people out. This ain't no game. A generation is at stake. And we're so busy with crafts and arts and PowerPoints that we're missing taking our neighborhoods for God. Why is your high school the way it is when your church is near it? Why? Man, I wish you'd catch a vision and have your kids just take over the school. Listen, y'all, y'all don't understand that teenagers will really do anything you really groom them to do. Unlike old people that you got to unlearn stuff with, teenagers will do anything. Can I tell you what our young people did? They felt sad for people that weren't Christian. I never forget when we went, we would go to the mall and uh, break the law. We did. Um, it was against the law for us to, uh, to, to proselytize inside of the mall. So we couldn't share our faith. So we would have this incredible choir, because to me, a choir, the anointing falls on a choir when there's a need for the anointing to be there. A community choir does not have the anointing with a bunch of weirdos who are in a recording room watching them. That's not a need for the anointing to fall. The anointing falls when there's brokenhearted people who need for the anointing to heal their broken heart. So we went where the people were. So we'd be in the mall, and this incredibly jamming youth choir, we would just start singing in the middle of the mall, like, you know, Whatever we singing, right? So it'd be like about 60 of us. Then the, the police would come, and we'd break up and go into stores and go shopping. I had a Nextel phone, and we would chirp. I said, meet me back in the other part. Then we'd come to another area, and we'd sing. And then groups of people started following us into stores, and then finally to come to Christ at the end of the whole deal. Because that was what youth ministry was about on a weekend. Are y'all listening? Strip club. 
opened up in uh, Chicago that was allowing young people to come in. And you know what Christians would do? Pray against it. Come on, isn't that what we do? Oh, we bind it, huh? Come on now, that's what y'all doing, that's what y'all, you're binding everything. We bind the drug dealers, bind them. We bind, bind, bind them. There's nothing wrong with binding and loosing, I believe in it. But faith without corresponding action is dead. And so we bound the club. But then we went in the club. <gasps> pastor, oh no. Oh, this is where we draw the line, Pastor. That's how people talk when they get real spiritual. Oh no, we will not find ourselves in a place of ill repute. Once we have come out of darkness, we have no need to go into places that are dark anymore. That is not what God would have for us. We want to meet in, in a church and we want to talk about things that we can pray about. Oh, there's power in binding and loosing, young man. And there's no need for you to take young people into a place of such darkness. What did Jesus do, idiot? Huh? What did Jesus do? He came into this sinful world and he walked among us. Listen, y'all. Salt doesn't taste steaky. When salt meets steak, salt don't taste steaky. Steak tastes salty. When the church meets the world, the church don't get worldly. Are y'all hearing this? So let, let, me, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I'm, I'm finished. I got three minutes and then I'm finished. <coughs> so we go into the club. Yes, the club. The strip club. So we, we did a drive-by. We had about, I don't know, eight or nine buses. We just took a portion of our youth ministry. We had about 1,500 youth that were coming every week. And they and see, the good thing about people who don't know nothing about church, all they know is the Bible and Jesus, so they don't, they don't have any fear and they don't have any confusion about what real ministry is. So I just said, hey, guys, I just need y'all to come with me. And they didn't even care where. I said, we're getting ready to just shut down something. They said, oh, that's tight, man, they're good. So, <laughs> and so we had the real cute girls, like, do you need us to, like, do anything to look like, you know? Because what we, what we used to do in, in, the, um, in the streets is we would rent limos and we'd have all our pretty girls uh, go through the sunroof and they thought that they were a celebrity. Because we would set up a sound stage and we'd be like, yeah, oh, that's Beyonce. And it don't be Beyonce at all. Anyway, they don't know. But anyway, so, so, anyway. so we go to the club. The buses are around the corner where nobody can see. So the pastor and his youth elders, elder board, we go in and we pay money into going to the club. And uh, so I get into the club and I said to the owner or whoever was it, I said, what are the rules of this club? They said, well, there's no, uh, nobody can wear a hat. I said, okay, I'm not wearing a hat. You must wear a shirt. I said, okay, I'm going to keep that on. Um, and, uh, uh, and you must, uh, something else, you must have shoes or something. I mean, something else. I said, okay, these are the only rules that pretty much, that govern this club. Yep, that's it, sir. I said, are you sure? They said, yes, sir. And so I was taping him, and so I immediately went uh, after we all went in. $20 a person, by the way. And they were, let, they were letting junior high kids into this club. So I went into the um, to the uh, back and, and got on my phone and called our church attorney and played the tape. I said, these are the rules that govern this club. Here's the person's name. Here's a sign that was up that said what the things are. That, uh, she said, is this true? I said, yep, this is the date and the time. And she recorded it, and that was great. So that was legally what we did to make sure that I was in accordance with the law of this place. So, uh, so then it's time to uh, get ready for the, the strip show, all right? And, and so they, they, they called out, you know, the, the, you know, the strip people, and they... Uh, <coughs> And, and so, uh, uh, you know, everybody was ready to. I mean, and they called the ladies out first. They had, it was a ladies and male strip thing, but they called the ladies out first. So I was like, yeah, yeah, that's what I've been waiting for. So all the guys get close. And so I hit the, the uh, next tail and say, it's time. So the buses round the corner. <coughs> all the kids get out of the buses kneel down, get against the building, and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost and intercede. Father, we bind in the name of Jesus every demonic work. That God, I mean, understanding the Word of God, praying the Word of God, excited about being in warfare. People got to step over them. And then what's so funny is that every time somebody tries to get in, they say, God bless you, sir. God bless you. God bless you, sir. God bless you. All right? So ain't nobody going in, right? So 
We kept the door open, but it's like a, a thousand of these kids around the building, and every time the people had to get through the groove, God bless you, sir. We pray you meet God in there, sir. We pray God bless you, sir. So, so while they're out there, we now, I mean, it was just like the Matrix. I ain't kidding. I felt like a superhero. I said, it's time. You know, everything kind of moved in slow motion. I do my coat back. You know, like the sound. You know what I'm saying? We're approaching. You're like, Doom. you know, approaching the stage. And so this is a time that you don't watch and pray. This is, this is the time you just pray. You, you. Because this is a strip show. And so. So we came with our heads bowed down to the mother dirt for real. <clears throat> Some of y'all don't know nothing about that. All right, hey, time is up. All right, so we're in this place, and to the top of our voices, all nine of us inside the room, about, I don't know, a thousand kids outside, we are now praying, Father, in the name of Jesus, we bind every demonic work of Satan. You love these women. They belong to you. I mean, praying loud, like preaching voice pray. I get a tap on my shoulder. Excuse me. I said, yes, sir. You can't do that here. I said, I don't have on a hat. I'm wearing a shirt, and I got on some shoes. You didn't say nothing about prayer, and I got louder. And every woman in that place left, and the whole club closed down and never reopened again. You can reclaim your city. You can reclaim your city. You can reclaim your city. Are you ready tonight? I don't need you to play games with me. Are you ready tonight? I need every one of you that are ready to stand on your feet real quick. I'm finished. Band, you all can come on up. Listen, y'all, let me tell you something. I can't recognize your faces. <clears throat> but if you come to another conference that I speak at, and you ain't done nothing, I'm going to slap you in Jesus' name. I'm serious. You think I'm crazy? How many of y'all know me? Fred, am I crazy? Fred will tell you I'm insane. I will slap you, not real hard, but just like an embarrassing slap, like a back slap. You know, that's an embarrassing one, ain't it? Like, you know, hey, you don't need no more revelation. Go! Jesus said go. You don't need any other revelation. You don't need a Greek etymology. Just go! The anointing of God is getting ready to be released in this house. Because very rarely are we in a position to receive real anointing. The spirit of the Antichrist is anti-anointing. It's fake counterfeit anointing that's being released on the church to, to further earthly kingdom church stuff. So there's fake anointing running around. And so we have stuff happening in church that we think is God, but it's not furthering the kingdom of God's principles. So today, because we're not about building our kingdom. We're about establishing Jesus' kingdom. We're not about building our name, huh? We're about building up the name of Christ. We're about raising up young people who will love God so fiercely that everybody in the whole community will know, man, God is on that young person. Are y'all ready to receive this today? If you're ready, if you don't mind, would you just lift your hands in his presence? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we love you today and we bless you. Thank you so much for these, your servants, who stand in this hallowed place. Father, we give you glory that you promised us that you would rebuild the waste cities, the cities that have been devastated for generations. And we pray right now that that revival would not begin with some person who we don't know, but strangers will become the ones who will shepherd. That means no names will become the shepherds. Raise up these young workers. Give them strength now to go. Give them boldness to go. We bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. Child of God, you are no longer afraid because greater is God in you than the devil that is in the world. There's no weapon formed against you, child of God, that will prosper. 
And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, God will condemn it. So we stand right now in faith, oh God, that our youth ministries will never be the same. Yes, we'll go to amusement parks. Yes, we'll have fun. But those things will be rewards for ministry. It won't be ministry in and of themselves. We will, as much as we can, teach the Word of God. We will train them in the way they should go. So when they're old, they will not depart from it. And from this day forward, let your anointing, O God, rest on these, your workers. Heal the brokenhearted. Bind up those who are in prison. Set the captives free. This is your charge. This is your charge. Receive the glory of God and his manifest anointing in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, Jesus, in the name of the Holy Ghost. Receive it. Receive it. Receive him. Receive him. And give him praise if you know you have it. In Jesus' name.